Um, so I wanted to then kick over to the, or jump over to the kind of the league transition, like resetting for what happens in 25. Like, first of all, but I think we talked about this maybe before, Duncan, I don't remember if it was on a show or privately, uh, so this may be like slightly repetitive, but like, if you think about it from a team's perspective, like definitely like the leagues go in a way just like net is negative, like assuming nothing, nothing replaces them like that's just bad, like you're just giving up money. And that's actually better for ESL, like it's essentially a subsidy for ESL and Blast from Valve, like if you were to work out that way. And so if you think about that, like it's not going to work that way because the teams will not allow for that. So then how do you replace that? And like, what are the biggest issues with the current format? It's that you have teams that just like are not good and don't invest in players and don't perform. So like, I think in the past like couple of years, like EG was always the example that performed the worst across both. And so like, how do you solve around that together with this new limitation? I think it's pretty obvious you start paying for, particip for participation. So like, it's just like, you know, you have to qualify for the event and when you qualify, you get paid money. And then there's like, Similar to how it was for, for Blast, for instance, is there's like a component tied to viewership and there's a component tied to your competitive success. And then you get some base amount for qualifying for the events and then you get increased amounts based on what, how much viewership you drive and then how far you make it competitively. And I think like that's the model that we'll shift into, which is like more of like merits based. I think what it'll do though, um, like if you set aside the stickers for the time being and only focus on this change, I think what it'll do is that it kind of puts the scene into this, like, like, con like you ha you'll have teams that are constantly on the bubble, basically. Like, you have some teams that are, like, comfortably qualifying and or are just, like, good enough that, like, even if they miss a couple of them, like, you know, they're not. Like, Navi's not leaving Counter-Strike or stopping investing in players just because they don't qualify for a couple of times. Like, Astralis has missed how many majors in a row now? Like, they're just gonna invest in players though i think they just took their payroll down a little bit in the last week but like generally speaking like they're gonna try to field a good team like they're not going away um but then you have a bunch of teams who are just kind of fighting fighting on the bubble and the more risky it becomes the more more like the less you can actually pay at that level unless you have extra cash and so that i think like kind of splits the scene a little bit and makes it harder for those teams now you could argue that it was already was the case it's just that it was fully fixed um I think, like, practically speaking, it might be slightly better or slightly worse for players, depending on how contracts are structured. You know, like, it might be that you end up getting more now because you're taking on risk, or if play players are risk averse and just from one fixed salaries, they probably will be a little bit lower because the teams don't know whether they'll be able to qualify and be able to make those payments. So I think, like, that's one thing. But then once you combine the stickers, which this has been reported now, I think like Angel TV did an article on it after I wrote the wrote the blog post about it. But like the Paris major stickers were like a multiple bigger than anything before. So before yeah. then, what you would use, what you basically counted on was if you were in the Legends capsule, you'd get like a million roughly. And like, you know, depending depending on the team deal, like maybe the players get like 50 percent. So the team would get half a million, which is like pretty meaningful towards covering your just operating expenses for that team. And, you know, the lower capsules would get maybe like 700K, 600K, something in that range. And then for Paris, the, the lowest tier capsule actually performed the best. They made four and a half million. Um, and then the Legends wow. capsule made three and a half million. And then the one in the middle made two and a half. So first of all, like there's like teams who, you know, lost in the qualification against like a much worse team, got upset and then ended up in the other bucket. And just ended up like... I mean, not... my joke goes at this, Tommy. The reason why you also can't use these numbers as a hard like business plan, plan is like the joke goes, if you do too well at the RMR, but then Navi fucks that one up, you get in the wrong capsule by doing too well at the qualifier. And then Navi's in the lower capsule and then they get all the money. Like that that's the weirdest part, but there's almost an arbitrary element of it, right? It's not about performance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't know. I mean, gener I think there's been like one major before from the data that I looked at where the Legends capsule did not do the best. And it was like similarly yeah. one where I think like MIBR and Navi were not Legends, like something like that, where like, you know, the like some of the teams that were the most popular drive the most sales, like ended up just like not being there. The other thing that's interesting besides just the, you know, like there's like a two million gap between the lowest at the bottom so like say you pay 50 percent to your players like that's still a million that you can't really budget on because like who knows like if you're you know if you're looking at rosters before the rmrs you probably peg astralis in as a team that qualifies 
you know, like you would have missed three years in a row. Like that's with these thicker amounts. I'm guessing that's something like, you know, six to eight million that you thought you were going to get that you're not going to get. Maybe half goes to players like three to four million like that you just need on hand to operate like that's hard to make work. And then the other piece is last year we only had one major, which obviously impacts the sales cycle and probably the demand for stickers because it's just a more rare event. And they kept the sticker sales open for, I think, like 180 days in total yeah. or 160, something like that, which yeah, is just like ages. Yeah. It's, it's just much longer than typical. And, you know, the tail gets worse and worse over time. Like you sell more during the event before the event. Then there's like the big jump again when they put them on sale. And, you know, like the tail decreases over time, but it's the positive increase. Like, the, you know, you're not having getting negative sales from it being open for a longer period of time. I think this time they'll be it'll be smaller. But there's also the question of just like what happens to the players? And like, was there some other reason that people just cared more about? Like, I think there's been some talk about like maybe there were reasons why like Chinese buyers really cared about that event more than some of the others. But like you don't you don't ever really know. And then, like, player base always goes up during the major. There's just so much more promotion, like, people talking about it. Like, Steam promotes Counter-Strike. All of a sudden, like, people go in, they see it because it's happening. You get more player base. I think there's probably a pretty good, or there is a pretty good correlation. I don't know how causal it is, but correlation is really strong between player base and sticker sales. I would guess that, like, a lot of it is causal, i.e. the more players, the more likely you're going to sell more stickers. CS2 has done... I think much better than people talk about. Like people are saying it's like dying, whatever. Like it's basically near the all-time highs of CSGO even now. And the CSGO all-time highs where because of the Paris major when it got all the promotion about being like the last Counter-Strike major, et cetera. And like before that, it was substantially lower. So like the number of players we have now is higher than CSGO ever had until like this time last year. So if you then think like, what might this do once you keep, once you get like the full promotion going, you can actually surpass Paris in player numbers. That wouldn't surprise me. I'm guessing that the sales period will be shorter. So, you know, maybe you'll get to like slightly less, like two thirds, 80% of, of the Paris major sales, maybe even similar, but it's just like such a gigantic number now that like, even if we think about like the top teams getting like a million from EPL or whatever the number is, like million two five, like, yeah, that maybe that becomes like performance based and your, you know, your new ranges that you might make between 800 and 125. Like that's 400. Like that's pretty meaningful to budget around. Like you can't spend that 400 unless you have that laying around and you can risk it. But it's nothing compared to millions. Yeah. I, you know, look, I, I think, uh, you know, there's definitely this weird, this weird thing that's going on in CS right now that I, I don't think necessarily it's a good thing it, it's kind of getting to that stage where very reminiscent of what was happening in dota with ti where almost like the rmr is this like super is super important you know you're seeing all these orgs come back create these dog shit teams you know recycle garbage players which by the way they have to fully commit to like you know a six month contract or whatever you know it's 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 not good business they throw a team together and they're hoping to sort of blunder their way through the rmrs and if that doesn't work these orgs aren't sticking around they're not here for like uh, we want to be part of the brave new world in 2025 with the open circuit comes back no obviously they're gonna they're gonna fuck off um and and the problem is that the disproportionate value to an org of participating in the RMR and getting that sticker money compared to participating even in a partnered league is making people like actually really less interested in the, in the broader circuit in general. Like, for example, a lot of people are missing a beat with this heroic story that's kind of happened where heroic have kind of they've left the louvre agreement early they've left ahead of the 2025 and it, it and it's uh significant because they were one of the johnny come lately's to the league so they paid the inflated price to be in uh esl you know they uh, and blast they got they got rinsed because they joined late uh same with like furia and big with the other uh, two teams and you know again what people are saying behind the scenes is they're just like there's no value in this and it's not even a long-term thing 
So we 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 don't want we don't see why we should have to stay in and pay our money for this revenue share that's like actually just pales in insignificance to to what we're going to get by virtue of being in a capsule with a min max team. By the way, what you're saying actually is the number one fear I have right now for Counter Strike, which is this world that everyone's being on, and they're all loving. By the way, this is where people mix up like your own sentimental feeling about like players and what th you would think be funny. It's like essentially Schadenfreude is not funny when it's your own house that's burning. It's just this fire <laughs> spreading slowly to your back. It's only funny when it's the other guy's house. You idiot! In Counter Strike, we cheer on as the fucking hole springs in the end of the boat that we're in so everyone's loving that falcons and australis didn't qualify like <laughs> they spent millions and they're gonna get nothing right that doesn't end in a good way like here's the obvious thing to say do you think that fucking ecstatic who is also danish are now going to take that sticker money and buy yabby and stown no they're not so they're never ever going to create a great team like you want at the major so maui nailed it maui's the one who has actually was able to put it into a sentence right now the most important thing in counter strike for any team is just to qualify out of the rmr that is it it is yeah, literally yeah. more important for your team and think how mental this is and whether you would Make a big lineup, whether you qualify to the major, not if you win the major. Winning the major is a drop in the bucket compared to qualifying to the major. That is so fucking stupid. Not least because here's an angle no one even thinks about, mate. I'm amazed there still hasn't been an org out there. So cynical they realize, right? What exact amount of JKS plus two Australians plus two people from other regions do I need to get the easy sticker money? I'm surprised people haven't started doing that, fucking with the Oceanic RMR and the Americas RMR because at this point like the joke is you get the millions as well from a shitter region yeah. you get to qualify get your millions meanwhile like we're seeing someone like Falcons who if people don't know were top four at the last big massive line we had they're not even going to be at their major that's supposedly a good thing I get that you think it's funny they didn't qualify but that's terrible for the scene like what are you again what are we building on like, surely you do want, guys, people to make super teams and to buy the best players. Like, we've all been complaining for years. Australis doesn't have a really great lineup. They had all those jobbers in, like, Altex and Bose and Borup and all. Well, now they've finally done it. They've made a super team like you all asked for, and now they're going to get no money for it. And so guess what? That's why they're signing fucking bro that their own guy doesn't even know. That's why Glaive isn't heading back through the other way, because why the fuck would they? They've got no money now. They've spent all their money, and they're not going to get any more. And next year, the part the thing goes away so like i don't think people realize like that is not a good situation because as bad as it is in ti at least at ti the money's going as you go through the tournament for fuck's sake it's not like just qualifying to ti gets you like four million you still have to place like i don't know fucking top 10 or something this is like we've actually made a worse version of ti just getting to the ti gives you all the fucking money and at the end if you win the ti in our analogy you get 500k on top of it it's like oh here's your four million for being from a shitter oceanic region oh did you win the major as well well have you got a, a spare finger for this fucking feather that we're going to give you <laughs> Fuck, what is this like the the because the, here's the point you have to understand if you understand anything about economics you have totally fucked the incentives the incentives are no longer just build the best team it's not that anymore that's not what it no, is no, now, no. sadly and 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 this is the, the the other interesting part to it is as we revert back to the open circuit we don't know what's going to happen to the circuit as we know it. I mean, like, I think Valve, it was like, okay, if you followed what happened with the DPC over in Dota, they basically said, listen, we're not we're not running the DPC anymore. Uh, we, we're going to get rid of it. And we imagine there's going to be a ton of incredible things that rise up and fill the gap. And it's like, bro, it's not fucking 2012 anymore, man. Like, people aren't going to take a punt on running an esports event because it's the most well documented way to probably lose money in esports. So, no, you're not going to get all these cool things happen. It would, it has to be established people with established infrastructure. And so, all that's ended up happening is the the Dream League has essentially been repurposed as, uh, you know, the road to Riyadh. <laughs> I love the name even. It's so cynical, isn't it? It's so right. cynical. The, 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 the road to the Riyadh Masters. 
and that's now been layered sort of over the the gaps where the dpc used to be and it's like maybe there will be other tournaments you know like i talked to ppd on a podcast recently and he's trying to run like you know a grassroots na league uh, for dota and he's losing loads of money doing it but he but he believes in the vision and it's like this is the fundamental problem that we're gonna have in cs that ultimately ESL, and they've even said as much in the town hall, if you read between the lines, the Esports World Cup is their big focus. The, 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 the part of the internal discussions around e the initial uh, Saudi takeover was how many events can we get in Riyadh a year? And, you know, there's talk that maybe every major esports final they run by 2026, maybe 20, you know, 2025 might be too soon, but they want to get more events in, in Riyadh, as many as possible. And then you see they're building cities for these teams to live in. It's like, what's going to be left for the teams that are frozen out? What if you're not good enough to be considered to be part of the Saudi Arabian Death Star? What if you're not, Right. Well, uh, you know, they've even said specifically, we're only going to pick 25 teams. And and and, and what, I, what I loved as well was Ralph Reichart, who's running it now, because coincidentally, they just needed the co-founder of ESL to go run this totally new and independent thing. Ralph Reichart's the, the, the guy, the benefactor, who chooses who gets into the Esports World Cup and therefore, by extension, gets these stipends, which I think he was calling a stimulus package, a one-time stimulus oh, package, Lord. right? Which is like, oh, it's <laughs> oh, it's so sexy. Talk to me. I love my esports sounding like a fucking meeting with a bank manager. Tell me more, Ralph, right? So anyway, he said a one-time fucking stimulus package, and then he said it's open to everyone, like full-on joker in batman tryout snap in the pool queue so everybody was invited so maybe you're not in the 25 but you could get this one-time money to ha you know to have a team to enter into the esports world cup what does the circuit outside of that look like when you already consider intel they're signed up long term i can't believe they're happy about it i can't believe you know esl deliberately withheld the announcement of the saudi buyout while they uh, talked to Valve about getting the majors, did their re-up with Intel, a bunch of other stuff. They deliberately held it because they knew it was going to be bad optics. And so, you know, what are we left with? Uh, you know, is Star Ladder coming back? Oh, cool. How many events a year? There's PGL. How many events a year? Are Blast going to make it? Are they going to turn a corner financially? Like, listen, I get it. I fucking hated the partnered leagues. I fought against partnered leagues, like, to my last breath. And then it was like, all, what they realized was, wait, all we have to do is change the word exclusive? <laughs> Fuck. And not even Valve give a shit? Wicked. Uh, and, 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 and you know, there's just... But, like, there has to be something after that. And the finances right now dick suggest there won't be. And so you know, that's the part, Richard, that no one's thought about who's the fan cheering on burning down the partner leagues, right? Presumably, I'm going to guess, Richard, they must be fans of teams that were in the partner league, right? There may be a fan of like Game Legion when they yeah, do that run. Yeah. What they're missing is Game Legion won't be in this thing, you dickhead. Richard's just basically yeah. said it to you right there. It will well, be all the same teams that were in the partner leagues, the biggest courts in the world, and they'll be in like a 2000 AD mega city. And then the yeah. joke is, your favorite team, they'll just be wandering the wastelands of the cursed earth as fucking freak mutants that no one ever sees. <laughs> And even yeah. you won't see them because they won't be on the broadcast, the idiots. And and, and and this is what I mean about like sort of be careful what you wish for because obviously it's great theoretically that we remove the partnered leagues and we have an open circuit and blast run these events and maybe Gamer Legion could get in and maybe Apex can get in and all these other tier 1.5 teams where it's like they've proven they can mix it up with the tier one. It, theoretically, that's great if you care about competition. But the reality is if you're not marketable, like Saudi aren't looking at are you a good team they're looking at are you going to be marketable will you get involved in their circuit will can you take some money will you take money to run a dota team to enter into their dota tournament and keep in mind as well a big part of the financial reward it's it's explicit that it has to be reach they don't because otherwise the sports washing part of it doesn't work you can't just get 10 really good teams and be like listen guys i know we've got a combined twitter following of fucking 2000 what are you washing at that point you're not distracting any anybody so it has to be the top orgs and so ultimately 
I think what ends up happening is we get to 2025, the Esports World Cup essentially becomes the Counter-Strike jewel in the crown. Spoiler, the word on the street is ESL aren't getting any majors in 2025 either, but, you know, don't fucking quote me on that. That's what everyone's kind of, like, chattering about behind the scenes. Um, but I don't think they care, because I've also been told you know, by multiple people over in the Death Star, they're like, look, the Esports World Cup is the ultimate fuck you to Valve everybody because how are you going to stop it? You can't. All the orgs are going to be on board. So it, you, 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 what, you've just created another haves and haves not situation, but the haves now will have more than they've ever had, and the have-nots now will never be invited to eat at that table. So I, I don't know. I, I, like... CS, it, it's gonna. It looks like we're fixing a problem, and we sort of are. But we're gonna have five other problems to fix in twenty twenty five. Well, you know, I think Tommy, and we'll we'll link his article here because he wrote an article called "The Transformation of Counter Strike," where he goes over kind of the dissolution of the partner leagues and the economics yeah. of uh, of the sticker system for the majors. But <clears throat> Tommy, just to synthesize this, I mean, to bring it back to esports winter, like basically, you view the dissolution of the partners league as subsidies for tournament organizers because they're not required to pay out revenue share any longer, which then gives more power back to the tournament organizers, less power to the teams. And what this means in a post Saudi investment world is that now everybody is just beholden to the whims of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and participation in the esports world cup. Like what, what would you say about, you know, how esports winter is affecting this situation? Because with the lack of venture capital going into these teams and the lack of revenue in general, it just seems like everybody just has to be on board with the esports World Cup and what Riyadh wants. Well, I mean, so I guess a couple of thoughts. One, I think the I think in a vacuum, it's true that it's a subsidy for TOs. I think in practice, what will end up happening is they'll probably end up paying a similar amount of money, but it'll just be structured for like participation. So mm -hmm. it'll be to the teams that qualify, but that's less secure. So if you think about who's like a fringe EPL partner team, um, I guess ENS is like not not in like a not I in like a put you on the performance. Spot, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> not not like not like performance basis, but uh, from like a financial basis, like yeah. If you if you go from having I don't actually know how much Richard probably knows better than how how much they've gotten, but I'm guessing like somewhere between 200k and half a million is what they were getting a year, um, is what I'm guessing. And so yeah. if you take that away, that's a whole of 200 to 500 that like maybe you'll end up making that maybe you'll even make more from qualifying for the events, but like you can't contract yourself to pay that out in salaries when you don't have the money, and so. If you think about the incentive structure that creates one, if players want stable salaries, which we all know players want, uh, like players only care about the guarantee amount. They don't really care about the upside from my experience of having been around this many times across different games. So if they only care about like the fixed amount, then one, the teams that have the most money to go back to what Richard was saying, they're going to be able to afford the most guaranteed. And so they'll always have an edge in every negotiation because they don't have to worry about what the year to year fluctuations look like in revenue share because they have money from wherever else. Yeah. And so I think like practically speaking, it just puts more more strength in the corner of whoever like the best finance teams are so like falcons for instance where it's more of like you know traditional sports investment where it's like you know think like a rich guy's vanity project of wanting to win a championship instead of trying to build a business um and then two i think what probably ends up happening is there's just not going to be as much visibility to what that amount of money is for the players and so i think the teams will actually end up better off if they just negotiate well with TO. So I think the, it's actually the players that lose, not the not the teams. Because what ends up happening is- I don't mind that the so much <laughs> these days. <laughs> the players have spent years winning. Yeah, winning. Yeah, the players have spent years winning. It's their turn well, for an L, I think. Yeah, the, the only winners have been the players in the last in the last 10 years. But I think it matters less for, you know, call it like the absolute best. I think it's harder for like, you know, again, like the fringe players who are trying to make like OK money so they can continue to play for a living. Um, and like they're not the Nikos and Simples of the world who are going to be millionaires multiple times over and just like essentially retire when they're done playing. Like that's a very select group. And there's a much larger group of people who I think in the current ecosystem and in like years past have been able to play like 
essentially professionally. And like, you know, their income will vary a lot depending on prize money, et cetera. And they're not going to be rich by any means, but like they can play for a living um, all year round. And I think that becomes harder under the new ecosystem. And then the question is like, is that actually why you want? Um, you know, like the argument that you often hear on, on Twitter from people is like, okay, like why don't why don't players just like go themselves like Astralis did? Like one, like the Astralis players own like 20% of the organization at the peak or 25. Well, Richard would know, I'm guessing the actual, but like almost nothing. Like it wasn't actually player owned. It's just that they had some equity. Um, and like players don't want to take that risk. I think like the I what what I read is that the Mongols guys essentially are doing that because they don't really have an organization. And so like I think they're basically ready to retire off of the Paris major and this upcoming major, assuming that they that they want to live in Mongolia. Um, but for other teams, like if the if he if players actually were not risk averse, like I would encourage every player to just like with these sticker sticker amounts, like if this major pays the same amount as Paris or something similar. I, if I were a player, I wouldn't want to have an org unless I saw a path to making more money than I would make from qualifying for two majors. Well, that's how Valve think about it. Valve, Valve, uh, they don't really understand what the orgs do in the ecosystem. And they well, but of... that, that's like that's why Dota is the way that Dota is too. Is yeah. that the the players have famously rejected orgs because they can just make all their money off of TI. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, an, an ultimate, you know, you can, you can be OG, you can be a player org, essentially, right? Like, I mean, this is the thing, like, people want to, you know, no one's really done a great uh, user test for it in CS. They all talk a good game, you know, it's be it's because the, the way the CS players brain work is they're not getting out of bed unless there's that fucking big fat salary there, you know, and so Valve don't really understand that. Uh, I've, I've tried explaining it to them, but they, they never get it. They think there's a world where, like Dota, five CS players will get together, come up with a wicked team name, which is fucking nameless or orgless for the 500th time, no branding, and they'll just go to it. They'll qualify for a major, go there, get all the sticker money themselves, reap all the dividends. That's That's Valve's fantasy. Right, they they and they don't see why it can't come true. But of course, those players would never get together and play, or even practice, or do anything if there wasn't the promise of an org. And the first thing they always ask for when they make these teams together, if they've been orgless for a while, is looking for org. Please share my email. Email in bio. Elon Musk. To see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content, well, subscribe to this channel, then, or you know, be a pleb and don't.